over basically the Treasury Department deciding where the US government bought things from or not. So he made sure that nobody in the United States government bought hemp products for anything. So uh, you know, he was able on one hand to not only you know, uh, influence other companies from getting out of hemp entirely uh, kind of in the back door, but he also just stopped the purchasing of it or the purchasing of anything that had any hemp in it at all by the federal government of the United States. He also stopped any research into hemp or, you know, through, you know, federal funding and put research into everything else but hemp. So, you know, the scientists weren't getting any funding to do things for it, and that slowly disappeared as he was in charge. Um, one of the other things that was sort of happening at the time, too, um, was uh, the, the, the sort of prohibition movement rearing its ugly head again. Uh, uh, next semester I do the history of prohibition. It's not something that happened just like 150 years ago or 100 years ago. It's, it's an ancient uh, um, uh, military tool. Um, so prohibition um, actually wasn't first applied to cannabis even in North America. For the most part, it was applied to alcohol. Uh, alcohol was prohibited in 1919 for a variety of reasons I don't want to get into right now. But one of the main ones that's not talked about is that farmers were producing and distilling their own um, biofuels on their farms. And by prohibiting alcohol, uh, the government stopped people from making their own fuels. So they actually switched from distilling uh, alcohol, or, or pretty much to, because that's in some ways, you know, ethanol and alcohol aren't a lot different. Um, they, they, you know, so they stopped being able to produce their own you know, biofuels in that sense. So what they do, they switch to hemp seed. And so uh, some did anyway, most of them didn't. Certainly Henry Ford was trying to promote it. Um, even when it became prohibited, Henry Ford had his car burning hemp seed oil, the bumpers made out of hemp, he was, he was all for it. And basically this hemp oil that you can buy in the store, it's a little expensive right now. You can pretty much put this into a diesel engine and drive away. Certainly a lot of the uh, biodiesel conversions that they have now, this would be the best fuel that you can buy. It's very expensive in part because of the economies of scale. It's not being grown uh, as much uh, as, as it could be if this was being grown across Canada as our number one crop. The price of the fuels would be much less than, than they, they, they are now. But uh, nevertheless, uh, um, you know, the uh, um, prohibition of, of both the first alcohol, but what, what happened then too is I think it was 1928 alcohol prohibition fell apart in the United States. So Andrew Mellon um, had on one hand a little experience using prohibition to eliminate a, an economy to help out his friends, because DuPont Chemicals too, the other thing that they were making mass money off of was additives for petrochemical companies, right? He had Gulf Oil Company going, so he was making fuel additives like 90, like all the stuff we're trying to stop them from using now is what they were putting out uh, back then. And so he was making uh, all sorts of money then, uh, even while he was Secretary of Treasury of the United States, right? Like, um, it's really crazy to look at the amount of power that this man had. But uh, he uh, went from experimenting in a way or, or with alcohol prohibition to uh, thinking about marijuana prohibition. In fact, he hired his nephew, his nephew-in-law apparently. His niece married this guy, apparently he didn't like him at all. And his theory, or part of what he did, was because he figured he was such a, a jerk, I guess, that he would be perfect to be the head of the narcotic control agency, or I forget exactly what it was called. But apparently, you know, some written material suggested that Andrew Mellon knew very well that his nephew-in-law was someone that, you know, nobody liked and didn't want to deal with, and if he gave him this job that was basically paying him to go around and destroy people's lives and stuff, that he would be perfect for it. Fortunately, he was. I don't think he, he stayed in the job till JFK came in. From like, yeah, 1920 something. Yeah, it's just nasty. <laughs> so, where the hell are we? Okay. Um, there he is. Boo. 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 <laughs> so, I just wanted to kind of highlight, you know, again, like I've talked about some of the different industries. That, that hemp, uh, you know, was competing with even back in, in the 1912, 16, 1920, through into the 1930s. And, and there's a lot. There's building materials. I got my hemp for it here. You know, we could be making press building materials all over. There's food, certainly. You know, uh, I got my uh, uh, hemp bliss, my chocolate hemp bliss, and my hemp nuts. Uh, I'm vegetarian. I haven't eaten meat in over 12 years now. And I, I'd like to eat more hemp than soya because it's actually more digestible than uh, than soya, and so 
Um, I put on 10 pounds in the last year, and I think a lot of it's got to do with eating more and more. And I didn't bring down all the stuff we got. We got like, I, I can't even start. But anyway, um, yeah, there's textiles. Oh, the other thing, DuPont Chemicals was all over was uh, uh, nylon as well, you know. Uh, so like they're creating all of these like new age products that are convincing people, oh, we've got all this new stuff. You don't need hemp anymore. That's old school. Just the poor people, just the farmers use hemp, right? You guys want to kind of come up to the new age and, 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 and all this other rhetoric was being spilled upon people, uh, which is why partly people were choosing not to buy hemp. So there's less and less hemp being sold as, as the 1920s and 30s progressed. And uh, certainly, you know, while there were some states that made cannabis uh, illegal, um, you know, it, it was something that, uh, you know, here in Canada, it happened even differently. Um, because these different industries and the rich families that were behind government in Canada had so much power and, and we knew so little about what they were doing, they made it illegal in Canada here in 1923, a full 14 years earlier than they did in the United States. Because again, these rich families, these rich circles just passed this law. We barely had a clue. Uh, Emily Murphy, I got the, the book over there, but uh, uh, a woman, uh, a former uh, judge, actually the first female judge in the British magistrate, who in some ways like did some really great things for women and stuff, but she also believed uh, in sterilizing dumb people, and, uh, and, and she was very racist as well, and, and she was behind prohibition. So it's one of Canada's heroes, but not. It's kind of weird. But she was very influential in changing laws here. I think it was 1928 it was made illegal in Britain, and 37 in the States, partly because it was a lot more democratic, at least back then, and, and how laws were passed and brought up. But uh, what sort of happened by 1937 is these different industries focused on eliminating hemp almost like kind of one at a time and all at once sort of thing. So that by the time 1937 came along, the only industries that really bought any hemp products at all in the United States were bird seed farmers, apparently eggs that are made from chickens that eat hemp nuts or hemp seeds are phenomenal, the omega uh, 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 sensitive fatty acids <laughs> The mega acids and the really stuff are just incredible for you um, and very good tasting as well. So the poultry industry was buying massive amounts of hemp seed and the other one was the medical industry. I'm going to read here real quick. This is uh, W.C. Williams testifying uh, in front of the Congress about this law. Cannabis and its preparations and derivatives are covered in the bill by the term marijuana as is defined in section 1 paragraph B. There is no evidence, however, that the medicinal use of these drugs has caused or is causing cannabis addiction. As remedial agents, they are used to an inconsiderable extent, and the obvious purpose and effect of this bill is to impose so many restrictions on their use as to prevent such use altogether. It's what's called the Marijuana Tax Act, but the bureaucracy was coming in. It was a prohibition. It wasn't a tax act at all. It was, you know, like, again, like, you know, just this kind of cover-up for their, their full intentions. Since the medicinal uses of cannabis has not caused and is not causing addiction, the prevention of the use of the drug for medical purposes can accomplish no good end whatsoever. How far it may serve to deprive the public of the benefits of a drug that on further research may prove to be of substantial benefit is impossible to foresee. But you would almost think that they did foresee it, that you know, after 70 years of making drugs for different things, you know, we've killed, I don't know, 30,000 people died from Vioxx a few years ago. Who knows how many are dying from new drugs even today. So it's like, and the substantial value of cannabis is only now being understood. The American Medical Association has no objective to any reasonable regulation of the medicinal use of cannabis and its preparations and derivatives. It does protest, however, against being called upon to pay a special tax to use special order forms in order to procure the drug, to keep special records concerning its professional use, and make special returns to the Treasury Department officials as conditions precedent to the use of cannabis in the practice of medicine. So as we see even today, you know, now that it's starting to become legal in Canada, the, the bureaucracy involved in using it for, for medical legal purposes is, uh, you know, uh,